as we come forward at this time, we'll be serving communion. Pastor Tom Heller can come up. dinner or supper with his disciples. They were, they were having the Passover meal. These are men that had done that ever since they could remember. They were Jewish men. And they did it year after year. And, and this would be the, their last time together, but they didn't really realize that. And um, that night, he was going to reveal to them that what they had been doing year in and year out was all about him. And I just want you to think for a moment that this was a tradition, like I said, that they had always, they'd always done. And um, most of us, I kind of grew up in a church, a really good church when I was young. I hadn't received the Lord yet. I had Christian parents. And I remember communion as a time when it was sort of scary. It was sort of, I had to make sure my heart was right or something before God, before I partook of this. But I want you to think about this. Jesus gave his body and his blood to a group of men that within a few hours would deny him and run and hide and betray him. We don't take communion because we checked our hearts out so well and because we're, we made sure that we're walking upright before the Lord. We take communion because we need Jesus. The, the communion he was offering to them, they didn't, in fact, when he told Peter, he would deny him. Peter said, not me. Everybody else might, but not me. And then he did three times before the cock broke where the alarm clock went off in the morning. But it's because we are here today and we are in need of our Savior. Even those of us that know Jesus and are saved. We are in need of our Savior. And the offering of communion is Him offering Himself. And then He told them, whenever you do this, whenever you have Passover, because he was talking to them in the middle of Passover. Whenever you have Passover, whenever you do this, for us, whenever we do communion, you do it remembering me. It is, the, it is I think the reason that Jesus wanted us to do it so often, because it takes us back to the basic of who we are. That we are lost, and he is our Savior. And that's why we're here today, is to remember the cross. To take a look at what he he did for us. Let's pray. Lord, you said as we take this bread, you broke it and you said, this is my body. And you gave it to these men that desperately needed your grace and your mercy and your compassion and your feeling because they were human, Lord, and they would fall in the next few hours. When you were in your darkest moment, they were not there. Father, we come to you today and we partake of this bread because we are hungry for you. Because we are in need of a fresh touch, of a feeling from you. Today, Lord, as we listen to the story of the cross, Lord, our minds can barely comprehend the agony and the pain. We, we can't comprehend it. But we ask, Lord, by, by the Holy Spirit, that you would open us up and that we would see just a more clear glimpse of the great love that you had for us. And we thank you for this bread. In Jesus' name, amen.
I don't know if there's anyone here today that, that has never received Jesus. I just want you to encourage you. Jesus, when he held up the wine, he said, this is my blood shed for you. The last time that Jesus gives an invitation in the scriptures, the Bible says that the, the bride and the spirit say, come, who are thirsty. Just like the song we sang. The gospel is not a message given to the self-righteous. It's not a message that come clean up our act. It's not a message given um, come be one of the good people. The message was that God wants to be part of your life and he offers himself. And because we are sinners, Jesus died on the cross to bridge that gap, to take my, he, he suffered in my place. He took the agony that I should have suffered because of my sin. He took, the Bible says he became sin for me. He who was God became sin. He took my shame. Things that I wouldn't tell anybody in my past. Jesus became. We can't comprehend that, but he became it. And then we know that three days later he got up. The Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. And the Bible says the same spirit that raised him from the dead, if you receive him, will raise you. So if you don't happen to know Jesus today, I would invite you to just let him into your heart as you take communion. For those of us that know Jesus, this is just symbolic of the blood that was shed for us. The only reason we can be here today and know that, that if something happened, then we would be in his presence. That we would see his face. That the, his arms would be wide open is because of the blood. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much. We can't even begin, like I said, to comprehend what happened on the cross, Lord, except Lord, we ask today that you, your Holy Spirit, Lord, would just let us sense and feel and know how loved we are. Lord, and we are so thankful. I can't even imagine um, where some of us would be if we'd even be alive. We thank, we're thankful, Lord, that you walk with us every day. We're thankful, Lord, that you are with us in the midst of every trial in the midst of every joy. And we're just thankful, Lord, for how much you love us. We're thankful, Lord, that you gave your life, your blood, that we might have the privilege of being called the children of the living God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody got so quiet. Whoa, are we having a great day? Oh, I just want to... On behalf of Koinea and Poema and Gapi Chapel, we're just so glad you're here. And, and we just simply like to tell you that we love you guys. And we're just glad to be a part of a family. Amen. Yeah. Hey, you know, I was with a friend of ours. I think all of you guys know him, Mike McIntosh, yesterday. Yeah. You know, crazy Mike. He, first thing he starts talking to me, as soon as I see him, he says, Terry, tell me, do you remember your first Easter with Pastor Chuck? I said, yeah. And, and he goes, well, let me tell you mine. He says, I just was starting to search for, for the Lord and, and I showed up at church and I went to I went to the, the front of the, the step stair in front of the you know where, where Pastor Chuck would normally be speaking. He says, I just knelt down and started praying. And then somebody tell me he says, Service isn't here, it's over at the other place where we're doing good Friday at noon. And Mike says, I ran over there and he says, I heard Pastor Chuck tell the story. He says, and that, and that touched my heart, and it, it changed me where how much I love Jesus Christ, what Good Friday did to my life. You know, we've continued. For many, many years, uh, we were down at Newport Harbor High doing Good Friday services. And then we, then we moved over to Pacific Amphitheater until they shut down, and maybe some of you guys remember that. And then we went over to Golden West College and did it there for a while. And then we ended, ended up... A, over at Pacific Amphitheater, 
but now we're continuing here at noon at Hillcrest Park and so we just thank the Lord that we're gathered together what I'd like to talk a few moments about is take it from the oldest book known to man it actually comes from the in the Bible we discover this oldest book it's from it's the book of Job maybe you guys have your Bible if you have a turn with me to Job chapter 9 as we'll take a look at some amazing things if you guys ever read Job you know that Job went through some hard times didn't he so something that I don't think any of us could imagine as it opens up how Job was stripped of you know, he lost his herds he's lost his camels he lost his servants you know, he lost his children. He even lost his wife, if you can imagine that. Everything that he could think of, it was absolutely taken away from him. You know, and so he just went and sat down. And then they said three of his friends came and sat with him, and they sat together for some seven, seven days and didn't say a word. Well, finally, this one friend, friend Bildad, they started to start talking to him and he started sharing with him about the justice of God and the things that he was going through as he finished up talking about the justice of God Job basically started asking himself questions one of them they started with how can a man be just before God how can I plead my case before God that's an interesting statement in and of ourselves how can we speak to God? How can I tell him about the plight that I'm going through? Well, as he was thinking, he seemed pondering him. I think at that time, his consciousness was working in two spots in his life. You ever find yourself talking to yourself and arguing amongst yourself? And we think that's kind of where Job was at that point, arguing amongst himself. The first part of Job chapter 9, he talks about the greatness of God. It tells us in verse 5, he says, uh, in uh, chapter 9 verse 5 he says which removeth the mountains and they know not which overturn them in his anger and as he was thinking about God he says he goes he's the one that moves mountains this past week on Monday I started driving down my daughter and my son-in-law down from Seattle and as we went by and that mountain that blew up a little while ago remember that a few years ago up there in Washington there was nothing left of it and as we went farther down the highway we ran, ran across Mount Shasta and you see this huge mountain you just look at it, and there's other lone mountains just sitting off and you go oh my goodness and Job says you're the one that removes mountains then as he goes on in verse 6 he says He's the one that shakes the earth. He says, which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof that tremble. Well, we can relate to that, can't we? We understand earthquakes. We understand that God, at any time, any moment, hopefully right now, now as we're sitting here, that he doesn't shake the earth here in Southern California, but he's the one that does it. He goes on in verse 7, he says, he commands the sun, which commands the sun, and it rises nothing up, and he seals up the stars. In verse number 8, he says, He spreads out the heaven, where, which alone spreadeth out the heaven, and he treadeth upon the waves of the sea. He says, with the span of his hands, he spreads out the heavens. He's able to see the stars, the magnitude of God. And so that's one part of Job, thinking about the greatness of God. And he's overwhelmed. And as he goes on in verse 11, he talks about his plight, the sinfulness of man. As he says in verse 11, he says, Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passes also, and I perceive him not. Otherwise, he says, I have limitation. When God comes by, I don't see him. I don't hear him. I don't, I don't know how to get in touch with him. You know, he was struggling with that. And when, as he speaks about strength, and he sees his own ability in, in strength, he tells us in verse 19, he says, If I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. He says, when I speak of strength, God is strong. Look at what just happened to my life in a moment, in a twinkling. Everything was gone. Everything was shattered in my life. I think David is talking here about the greatness and the, how awesome he is. In Psalm 8, David spoke about the same thing. In verse 3, we said, when I consider the heavens, when I take time to consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, he says, the moon, the stars that thou hast ordained. He asks himself a question. He says, what, a, what is man 
that thou art mindful of him. He says, and the son of man that thou had visited us. Who am I? The, as even as Job was looking at the greatness of God, of who he is, David was saying the same thing. And as you drop down in chapter 9, it, as Job is considering these things, he realized his state and the greatness of God. He, he cries out, he says, he says, Neither is there a day's man between us that it might lay his hand upon both of us. He says, I got, a tr I got troubles in my life. Because I realized the holiness and the greatness of God. And I realized my sinful uh, plight in life. He says, but I don't have anybody to bridge the gap. You know, he didn't realize that God would send his own son. That that day is coming to be able to bridge the gap. See, the distance between God and man is great. Why? Because man has rebelled against God. Man hasn't come into the presence of the Lord, doesn't know the Lord, know the Lord. There's a moral distance between man and God. It's the sin of man compared to holiness, the righteousness of, of God. The Bible tells us that many people live on do, two different planes. Tom mentioned it here earlier. About that of being those who are born again, who have had their spirit become alive, that walk into fellowship with the Lord, and those who walk without so far, another one is his, his friends. As you read through Job, these are the kind of friends you don't really want, but they had a lot of strong opinions. But he said a great question. He said to Job, who by searching can find out God? Which one of us by any natural, you know, intellectual pursuit is able to find God or know who he is? Paul said, the natural mind discerneth not the things of the spirit, neither can they see the, in ourselves that we, us trying to our own pursuit whatever it might have been our our natural mind our natural being cannot reach him and make our way to god because there's a, a gulf between the two that's what job is saying we need a, somebody to go between somebody to be able to bridge the gap who is he as we know the gap is huge we we know that we need a, a savior Paul, in writing his epistle to Timothy, he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, he says, There is one God and one mediator between God and man. And he says, The man is Christ Jesus. He's the one who's able to bridge the gap between man and God. And God sent his son, his only begotten son, because he, why, folks? Because he loves us. He said his only son, to bridge that gap. I have one son. His name's Robert. I see Odin has some boys here. here. They're out here running around. You know, I like you guys. In fact, I might even think I love you guys. But I, I don't think I would give up my son, my only son, to sacrifice his life for you as much as I love you. Think about our Heavenly Father, that he was willing he was desirous of our fellowship, our desire to know us, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to go to the cross, to bridge the gap. Because God being holy and us being sinful, he was the only one who was able to put his hand upon God and put our, his hand upon man to be able to bridge that gap in order to bring us in that right relationship with Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing here today is remembering. See, this past Sunday was known as Palm Sunday. In fact, it tells us in Psalm 118, he says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad therein. It was God's plan to send his son on a particular day to come right in, in into Jerusalem. But Daniel tells us in Daniel chapter 9 that he came in there not of, for himself. But he told them that the first time that Jesus came into Jerusalem, that he would be cut off. He'd be cut off from the land of the living. He'd be cut off for our sake. God has so loved us from the foundation of the world that he wanted to have fellowship with us, that he was willing to give his son. I don't know about you, but that just causes me to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for going to the cross for me. Thank you for willing to die for me. Thank you for willing to, to bear my pain upon yourself. And the thing that's so amazing, when it says that he that knew no sin, 
became sin for our lives, for us. And I can't speak for you. All I, can, all I do know is myself. I needed a savior. I, like Job, I needed somebody to bridge the gap. Because my life is filled with sin and has been filled with sin. And I needed the forgiveness in order that I might have fellowship with the Lord. I tried the different pursuits. And they didn't bring me in that place where I could know God. Even as Zophar said, as, you know, your intellectual pursuit, you can't pound on the, the doors of heaven and try to get in. If you're trying to do it through good works, it won't make it. If you try all kinds of different means, you'll fall short of it. Because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. And it tells us that for the wages, there's those, you know, those days that we fall short is known as sin. He says the wages of, of sin is what, folks? It's death. But we don't need to die. We don't need to taste the death because Jesus became death for us. He went to the cross and he died for us in order that we might have the hope today. It's so beautiful. It's so exciting to think about why, why do we call this day a good Friday? It wasn't good for Jesus. Remember as he was going into the garden and he was sweating tears of blood. He, he says, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. But he was willing to submit to the, the, the will of the Father in order that we might have that forgiveness of sin. It's good because of us that we're able to reap the benefits of the forgiveness of sin. You know, Friday isn't the end of the story. Friday is not the end of the story because Sunday's coming. The beautiful thing is Sunday, the Bible tells us that after three days, he rose from the dead. He rose victorious over what? Over sin and death. And if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have that promise in you, even as Jesus said, I am what? The resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me shall do no what? You shall never die. You'll never taste of death. Isn't that good news? Yeah. We as Christians should be filled with joy. We as believers should have all hope because not only do we have forgiveness today, but we have hope of our future. As Tom was finishing up communion, as he was sharing, as we, as we finish up here, one thing Jesus said is he knew he, we would be gathering. He knew that we would be sharing in communion. He says, do this. Do this in remembrance of me until what? Until what day? Until I come. Until I come. See, not only the promise of Good Friday is the forgiveness of sin, but it also should remind us is that Jesus Christ is coming back again. We have a hope of our future, and that hope is sure. I'm so excited for what Jesus has done for me. Why don't we pray, and Odin's going to come, and Michael's going to come and close us in some songs. Father, we do thank you. Lord, sometimes we don't even know how to express words the kindness that you show us, the love that you demonstrate to us, that even while we're, we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you for that hope that you've given us, Lord, that, that tremendous knowledge of forgiveness, that we stand clean before the Father because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we do say thank you. We ask even right now, Lord, as we leave this place and we head on out and we make our way to friends and family, Lord, they might ask you, how you doing? And Lord, help us to remember that we're doing great because of Calvary. And we'll rejoice even this day, the work that you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Awesome. Um.
where you can worship God doesn't matter where it is go somewhere where people truly believe that he rose for that is our blessed hope is that we will rise again and be alive forevermore these canopies are temporary we're going to take them down as soon as you leave these tents our bodies are temporary and when they are taken down you will be moved into a new building a new structure that is eternal in the heavens Jesus said in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would not have told you so he says I go and I will return I go to re prepare a place for you in my house my father's house are these many mansions I go to prepare that place for you and it doesn't mean that we're all going to move into Beverly Hills or Bel Air what it means is that we are going to become as Jesus is when he is revealed, we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. And we have his inheritance that God has prepared for us. So it's not just that your sins have been forgiven. That's infinitely wonderful. Every sin you've ever committed, every sin that you'll ever commit, has been washed away by that sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we celebrated today. But much more so, that was done so that you can have entrance into the kingdom of heaven and live forever the way that God always intended man to live. So go and rejoice and be glad for he is coming. He is risen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for coming. <laughs>